Brad, um, welcome to Berlin. Um, how authentic are you, I, we as VCs in this conversation? And the reason I say that is, you know, USV was first set at the gate with a network effect thesis, uh, invested in a lot of companies that became dominant platforms through the network effect. And pre-USV and pre-my time, I think it was still at university, I'm sure we would have loved to invest it in Google and Amazon. So essentially the company's running the internet. And now here we are saying, that's bad. We should feel the army running the other direction. So how uh, authentic can we really be in this conversation as venture capitalists? Um, <clears throat> nice way to start, you know, I mean... Uh, <laughs> Challenging. Are you awake? I, I think, did he just challenge my integrity? I, I think right up front. Um, so I think, I think we can actually be very authentic. I, I am, I'm a capitalist. I believe in capitalism. I believe in decentralized, emergent, bottom-up innovation. And I believe that capitalism is a way to support that kind of innovation. Um, the problem that we have in the market today is that, um, you know, and this is going to be a problem as we look forward, is that when we were investing in Twitter, Tumblr, Foursquare, all these network effect businesses, uh, we thought we were being sort of innovative and moving beyond you know, the classic infrastructure investment that was protected by patents and copyrights and things like that. And, and we were looking for a new kind of defensibility in network effects. And in fact, that turned out to be true. The problem is it turned out to be too true. Um, and we are now living in a world that actually resembles uh, a world that I was a part of in the mid-90s. In, in 1995, there were some 2,000 PC software companies, all independent companies, all, many of them venture back, doing really interesting things. In 2000, those had been collapsed into one, and it was Microsoft, either the office suite or the operating system. And I think we're in the same environment today. We're in an era of consolidation on the web. Uh, it is just very, very difficult to compete with Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon as a startup right now. So as a venture investor, I look at that and say, well, I don't want to bet on a company that's going direct head to head with these dominant network effects. Um, and so I'm actually genuinely, authentically interested in decentralization and, and understanding the mechanism of a network effect and the source of that market power. I'd like to see that devolved and I'd like to see a, a new era of innovation and opportunity from the bottom up. Um, there's a whole nother set of questions about what the nature of this new set of companies is gonna be and whether or not they will be good investments. We can talk about that. Um, and, and then there's another question, which is none of us really saw, you know, the, the network effect market power early on. Um, and so, you know, the question here is if we disaggregate uh, the industry through these decentralizing platforms, what's the re-aggregation that we're not going to see? And what's, what's the new source of market power that's going to catch us by surprise? And can we do anything to prevent that in the way we design these platforms? Yeah, thanks for skipping to the next two bullets. I'm sure you're reading off my, <clears throat> my phone. So let's definitely talk about the second one. So um, why, why are these then good investments? All of the companies presenting here today, others, what makes them defensible and not, I think as Juan said, a script that can be replaced? So I don't actually have an answer to the question of what makes them defensible. Um, but we didn't have the answer to the effect to that question when we made the investment in Twitter either. Um, and so, you know, what makes them disruptive? I can I can answer that question, um, and that makes it interesting to us. And you know, we're we're willing to take the risk that we'll you know we'll the, understand the business model as as it emerges. But what I my guess is that the world we're heading into, and actually I'd go beyond that to say it's my hope that we're heading into a world of a larger number of smaller companies, each of which is sustainable on their own and differentiated in ways that are less about market power and more about user experience. And uh, I think that's a good world. I think it may be more difficult for us as investors to invest in that world. We may have to make a larger number of smaller investments in that world. Um, and that's a hard thing to manage. But it's, um, it's not, not only is it a better world, but the, the great thing about capitalism, it's the only choice. 
you know, you can't compete with this, you know, dominant network effect market power trying to offer a directly analogous service because you don't have the same data set to, to start with. And so um, this is the only choice we have. Great. So uh, yesterday over pizza, we talked about re-aggregation of decentralized networks to provide a good user experience. You just mentioned it. And so aren't we maybe being a bit naive that we're fielding these decentralized technologies and building these stacks, but then we're going to need the equivalence of a search engine and other things to make the user experience good. And um, maybe Open Bazaar is a, is a good one to talk about that. Well, I think that is the challenge for decentralization. And, and you know, it's really, I mentioned it earlier, but it's really easy to illustrate with, with Google. I mean, once the media, you know, prior to the internet, the media industry was defined by distribution, uh, radio station, television station, they controlled what you saw. After the internet, everybody could get access to everything. And the problem was, what were you trying to find and where was it? And that is what gave rise to Google. So the same thing is going to happen with a decentralized marketplace. Uh, Open Bazaar is a protocol-based marketplace where anybody that runs the stack can trade with anybody else that runs the stack. But the question is, how do you find the thing that you're looking for? And and you know what you know. And decentralized search is a very very hard technical problem. It might be a lot easier to solve it with a centralized search, but it kind of defeats a lot of the purpose of the marketplace. Um, and so it, I, you know, I, I, I guess it's, it is a hard problem. Um, and I don't have an answer to, to that. I think um, to, if I had to guess where the, the re-aggregation is going to happen in these fully decentralized systems, um, it's going to happen someplace in the interface between, as an example, the cryptocurrency and the fiat currency, if you move things back and forth. And that is going to have something to do with identity. Um, and there will be certain legal requirements to you know, be able to, to tell people who you are. And I worry a little bit that that's going to be the, um, the re-aggregation point of these decentralized systems. Great. Um, then just talking about our role in investing in these kind of open protocol, open source companies, and then there's a company at the side that has taken venture capital is on an economic mission, and the more money you raise, the more potential conflict of interest there is to, you know, maybe restrict the open side of things to have the economic side benefit. How, how do we need to reshape our thinking when we're investing in these things and be prepared to accept... Um, different kinds of economic missions? Well, uh, I don't think we have a choice. Again, I'm a fan of capitalism, and the capitalism, you know, the, the market will dictate what we can do. Um, I don't think we have a choice. I think we have to reinvent ourselves, and I think it's, you know, it's, it'd be arrogant for investors to, to say, you know, that, that the market should, should, you know, reflect our needs or our interests. Um, and so we have to do that. So the... The question for an entrepreneur is a really, really interesting question. Um, we may be actually heading into a world where it'll be easier to make this choice, but there has been, until recently, enough momentum in the sort of internet, uh, in in internet marketplace that people have been able to raise a lot of money at a rel relatively high valuations. And it's very, very hard <laughs> to turn that down as an entrepreneur. But what I, th I think very few entrepreneurs realize is the trap that they were creating for themselves. If you raise that money at that valuation, you have invited in a set of partners who have an expectation of a return uh, as a multiple of that valuation. And that means you have to somehow, someday, generate that much value. Um, and that may you know, foreclose, as Kieran says, a lot of business models. It may may make it very difficult for you to um, go for a, you know, a very thin layer of value across a very large number of companies um, because, um, you know, the only way you could get a lot of companies to accept that platform value is by being very generous with the code and with the, the terms of the use of that platform. And so um, I would encourage everybody who is 
um, you know, working on one of these platforms and thinking that monetization is going to happen on top of the platform. The platform will be a protocol, protocol will be broadly shared, monetization will happen in some way on top of that platform. Oftentimes you expect multiple competitors on top of that platform, um, you know, competing with you for that sliver of monetization. Uh, to be very careful about how much money you take and at what valuation, because if you, um, you know, you could create, you could take what was a wonderful business. Somebody mentioned, you know, a lifestyle business that was making five hundred thousand dollars a year, you know, and if it's two or three people, that is a pretty damn good lifestyle, and um, and that business could be killed if you raised, you know, millions of dollars because the the venture investors at that point would say you know, that's not good enough. They, they push you for something that ultimately kills the business. So be very careful about that. Sorry. Long answer. No, good. Um, you said, you know, as VCs, we shouldn't be as arrogant to think that, the, you know, the market should shape the way our investment needs are. And in fact, I would say that decentralized space is one of the ones that is definitely not doing it. Uh, there have been some pretty fr frighteningly positive coin sales and other ways of getting funding. Um, do you think that our model, the way we're doing it today, is a little bit under threat that we're expecting a 20% equity stake for investing in a company, or do we need to be rethinking it and buying coins and other pieces of, of decentralized ecosystems? Um, the best way I, I think I can answer that question is to talk about something that uh, I saw happen in the early 2000s. Um, the, the VC industry did um, what I think was a pretty dumb thing. In the 90s, a large part of the venture capital industry was putting the internet infrastructure in place, switches, routers, chips. The model was um, that, that you, you, know, you backed a professor out of Stanford or Berkeley and you know, with a $3 million financing, Series A, they spent two years, they built something that was defensible through proprietary you know, uh, patents and, and copyrights and things, and then they hired their sales force and blah, 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 um, and you know, ultimately sold it to AT&T or whatever. Um, that went away with the early web. All of a sudden, you know, it was a very, very different model. And a lot of those VCs, rather than investing in what they talked about as this fuzzy stuff on top that wasn't defensible and you know, wasn't real hard technology, uh, went to other places where they could repeat the model. They went to energy, they went to material science, they went to uh, a, a bunch of these you know, big bet places. All of those failed. Um, the people who succeeded, and it's actually interesting that it's a new crop of VCs who didn't really exist in the 90s, who adapted to a new model where they couldn't get necessarily the 20% ownership up front, and they, they basically worked with the companies to figure out how to build a relationship that, that have you know, been the dominant investors in this new crop of companies. And so I think that's going to happen again. You know, I think it's uh, incumbent on, you know, Kieran and I and everybody else who's one of the new crop of VCs to figure out if we can reinvent ourselves. The last guys had a really hard time with it. There's no guarantee that we can do it. It's a tough problem, but that's our problem. Um, um, yeah, so just uh, thinking about, um, you know, venture capital um, evolving um, in this space and forming a thesis. So USV recently refreshed their thesis, less obvious network effects. Um, you know, how do you see uh, your, your thesis evolving further? Is that it for the next two years with, with that refresh or are you rethinking this as, uh, as you're witnessing more of this? So, um, yeah, we're rethinking it all the time. I'd like to think that that's the case. Um, it's interesting in that you want to stand for something because that is the way people identify you. And I guess if I had to think, pick the one thing that, that we, all of us, just completely believe in, it's emergent, decentralized, bottom-up innovation. And that is because the larger an organization it is, the more challenging it is for it to innovate aggressively without undermining its existing business or challenging internal political structures and things like that. So small organizations can go for it, they can be aggressive. That is a much better model for innovation. And so um, we like the fact that we're able to invest in small organizations as a, as a venture capital firm. Um, but, um, you know, I, 
I, I, I do think that um, the, you know, the business is gonna change, and I guess I'm not really answering the question about how our thesis is involved or what our new thesis is. It's, you know, it, it is you know, following that innovation to wherever it goes and figuring out how we can be helpful. Um, another kind of topic that's been floating around uh, the room the whole time is, you know, both of our firms, I, I, this may not be 100% correct, but we're investing more down stack these days in the protocol layer. And we had this argument conversation yesterday with a bunch of people, um, how fuzzy, milky is the conversation around a clear application layer? So what is something that people who don't understand IPFS and other things and, and, and block stack, um, but they understand that the application is 10 times better. Um, does that concern you that maybe we're sort of seeing the first wave, but we don't yet have clarity on the application side? Uh, it does concern me, but I don't think there's any choice. I think in, until the infrastructure is in place, the applications can't be built, and in, until the infrastructure is broadly shared, in the case of this particular kind of infrastructure, which requires a certain amount of uh, consensus and agreement about what that underlying infrastructure is going to look like. Until we achieve that consensus, it's hard to imagine how we can really build the applications layer. Um, there are obviously a number of people who are doing, I would think of them as sort of demonstration apps on top of these platforms, um, and I think that's useful. Um, but uh, I, you know, I feel, it's funny, it, it, it feels a lot like the conversations I was having in 94, 95 about the internet when people were saying, well, just tell me wh why I should care. Um, and if I had to, you know, and you find yourself answering the question in terms of the technology of TCP IP and the distributed net and, you know, that was designed by the RAND Corporation to survive a massive nuclear attack, so there's no single point of failure, and they're looking at you like you have two heads. and. I feel like we're at the same stage now um, that you know we, we fall back to describing what's happening in terms of protocols and technologies and not in terms of user experience. But I don't know another way around it. I think we have to put this infrastructure in place and I think we'll see the applications emerge. I hope so too. Um, any questions, not for me, for Brad? Any, anything, okay, maybe over there? Yeah, for Wierenski from Open Media Cluster. Um, we've been talking about creating a, a different infrastructure which can support decentralized well, new uh, startups to fight the giants. But then uh, we talk about this infrastructure as a softer, top softer layer. And we don't go down to a harder, softer, and which are currently controlled formally and informally through bugs and uh, vulnerabilities by others. So if our number one uh, value added is trust, uh, more trustworthy, more security, uh, respect to the platforms, unless this infrastructure actually includes down to CPU fabrication and so on, so that, mm, something that uh, uh, you can actually argue it's more trustworthy, um, are we really having an infrastructure or are we having something that NSA or many other actors can bring down anytime they want? That was a hard question. Do you want to take that? Uh, uh, no, I no. said. It's, it's, <laughs> um, so, I, 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 you know, so the, the, I think that if you look at a lot of the protocol work, if you think, I mean, you think about what people have tried to do with Bitcoin. They've obviously tried to create something that was robust and defensible um, from a security perspective. Um, yes, you can imagine that the person that controls the operating system, the person that controls the, the chip design could still find a way to essentially, you know, take screenshots um, and pull data before it ever gets encrypted either by the operating system or by the application. Um, and so, yes, I think there is a vulnerability there. There's a really interesting trade-off here. I come down on the side of general purpose computing. I, I worry that the, every solution I've heard of for solving these problems lock down computers in a way that make it um, impossible to verify their integrity, um, but in theory more secure. I'd rather have an open computing platform with an open source software stack and a sort of collective security model than one that depends on the integrity of the chip designer. But, you know, that. I, you know, I don't, I don't know whether we can get to a point where 
you know, security is a kind of a crowdsource phenomenon with a resilient model as opposed to a perfect model. It, re it adapts quickly when it finds flaws as opposed to prevents any possibility of a flaw. But yeah, there's still a lot of holes in, in all of these systems. They're no more than there are today. I mean, we st we're, you know, we're vulnerable right now to an Apple hack. Uh, it's interesting if you watch the debate between Apple and the FBI, nobody's ever you know, challenging the fact that you know, Apple is telling you that they're encrypting your bits, but there's no way for you to prove that they're not keeping a copy of all those bits. Um, so right now we trust them. Um, I don't think we're any worse off than we are today in terms of these end devices, and I think it is a better model to encrypt data at rest and as it moves than it is to try and, you know, create a hardened system that's more brittle. But that's just me. Just go to the other side of the room. Philip? Um, <clears throat> you said you're going to invest or you're looking at investing in more smaller companies, uh, but isn't the actual reality today that the bigger companies just take more of the pie and are driving returns more specifically through, you know, obviously Google, Facebook, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you square that with saying, okay, we're looking at more, you know, the more distributed returns and smaller bets or smaller companies, and then the market actually kind of bifurcating much more into very, very, very large and small. So there's a concept in investing called a pair trade, where you actually make two investments and it's designed to hedge, you know, one versus the other. Um, if I were a public market trader, I might buy some of these stocks and it'd be depressing to me to have to do it because I would be acknowledging that their market power is going to continue to dominate for a long time and I'd much rather undermine that market power with a number of small companies. But the reality is I'm a startup investor and so I don't have the luxury of investing in Google or Facebook at this point. Um, and so the only option I have is to invest in things that either avoid competition with them because they're in some, you know, niche or some obscure network effect, as, as Kieran says, it's not on their radar, um, or it's beyond their competence because it involves some application-specific implementation that they wouldn't be able to do, or something that disrupts them. And it's, you know, the, the, you know, the more exciting thing for me is to think in terms of what ultimately undoes this market power and, and how can we be a part of that. Great, we'll do one more and then we'll continue over drinks and dinner. A rather simple question, uh, given you've been talking about network, net, network effects. So I'm assuming you already have an existing network. So essentially you've already committed to a set of, a, a net, a set of network. And right now, what you're kind of looking at is a possibility of disrupting that network. Essentially, you are betting on betting against your own net worth in that sense. Is, am I right in saying that? So what would be your risk mitigation strategy for that? So, um, I'm not, I mean, so yes, we made a number of investments in businesses that were defensible through network effects. And now we're spending a lot of time trying to think about the nature of those effects and how we would undo those. And so in theory, those businesses, businesses like Twitter and Etsy and Foursquare would all be at some risk. Um, so maybe we have the pair trade that I was talking about already. Um, but I think there, there's a very long transition. I think that most of the companies that we've invested in are actually fairly open about this model of disaggregation and decentralization and are perhaps going to get there more easily than some of the more dominant ones. But frankly, you know, we're putting a new fund to work and that new fund is going to go into businesses that we think can grow in the current environment that's dominated by these large companies. Okay, I'm going to get into trouble with the event organizers if I don't end it on time. So thank you, Brad. And Brad's around, so just grab him for any further questions.